And uh, glad you're here with us. I want to say welcome to all the visitors. And uh, John has got a migraine this morning, so we need to pray for John. I never have a headache, Foster. And I thank God for that. I never have a headache. I, I don't know, Daryl, what it would mean to have a migraine headache. Thank I hope God. Never yeah. do, but I know one time Michael was in a doctor's office. This girl is raw daylight. Her mom come leading her out of that doctor's office. And I said, what in the world was wrong with that girl? They said, a migraine headache. And I mean, she had to be led out of the office, Mike. So let's, uh, let's continue to pray for uh, John. And, uh, and John, if you're watching, we miss you. And uh, I want to say, uh, on the announcements, just have one announcement that I, I need to make. On the 18th, if anyone would like to come and, and, and just be with the kids and enjoy an afternoon at the Stadium City Street, that will be our last service in the old building. And we're going to have a uh, Christmas celebration. We call it a big Christmas celebration. And uh, we do gifts from infant to 16 years of old, 16 years of age. And if you've got any children, sign them up and bring them. Because we love to have them. And we, we want to make it special for them. People say, well, why don't you forget them at 12 years old? If I was 16, Mike, I'd like to be remembered yeah. and have a gift. And we always give them a gift card, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Yeah. When you can come out at 3 o'clock, we've been donated 45 cases of Gatorade off already. And we're hoping to get twice that many more. If we get twice that many more, we're going to give each family a case of Gatorade. And some candy, some good chocolate candy and stuff, Mike. So, uh, if you can't come out here with us, on a prayer request, please, please pray for John. He does have a migraine headache. And Chase, Chase has got a stomach virus. Pray for James Bolash. How are you, James, Brother Charles? He's doing great, uh, Charlie. Uh, yeah. He had, it took as long as I've come to hear that he can't stand his arm to hit his side. So, he said about next Sunday he'd be able to get back in the house. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Yes, praise Amen. We'll continue to pray for him. James Bolas, he's a good man. He's a good man. Uh, also, pray for our name. Bless her heart with the shingles. I can't imagine the shingles. When I ran from a guy, he had the shingles, and he said they could not let the sheep touch his body. That's how hard it hurt, her. I mean, Mike. But uh, we just continue to pray for our name. I got a text on my phone this morning. A lady, a lady sits with a woman. She calls her Mama Cat. K-A-T-Z. And her blood pressure and her oxygen drop for no reason whatsoever. So they've got her at the emergency room. She needs your prayers. And so let's pray for her. If anyone has a prayer request, you won't call out. Anybody with an unspoken prayer request? And from everywhere. You know, God knows, Mike, and He knows our the needs He's more than right. He does. He yes. knows He does. But, uh, and God can, Jack, God can meet the needs. Yes, he can. And as Murph says, He will meet the needs. He will. Uh, does anyone want to come up with a special prayer? You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a time when you can come up and you can join around the altar and you can pray. I'm going to ask somebody, some lady in here, I don't care who it is, would you come up and stand in for Mama Cat? Because if my, 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 if my blood pressure and my oxygen dropped for no reason whatsoever, I'd be uh, really alarmed. And I'd, I'd be honored to have somebody stand in for me for prayer. Would any woman in this church feel led to uh, come on up? You might come on, please. Anyone else need prayer? Just come on together and gather Sure.
uh, it was foretold how that God would make provision for his people by sending his son. It was first given there. So reading in verse 13, And the Lord God said to woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than cattle, than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And this is what he promised Satan he would do. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This verse, this last one that I read, contains the first proclamation of the gospel, all of the richness, the mercy, the sorrow, and the glory of God's redeeming work with man is here in this portion of scripture. God promises to bring a redeemer from the seed of the woman. He will be completely human, yet divinely begotten. That serpent of old, called the devil, would war with the seed, according to Revelation 12, and would smite him. But even as the serpent struck at his heel, his foot would descend, crushing the serpent's, serpent's head. Praise God. In Christ's life and death, the scripture was fulfilled, divinely begotten, yet fully human. By his death and resurrection, he has defeated and made a public yes. spectacle of yes. the powers yes. of hell. Yes. Praise God. The first messianic promise is one of the most succinct statements of the gospel to be found anywhere. We are living in an exciting time. As Sister yeah. Iris was teaching Sunday school this yeah. morning, I thought, Lord, we are seeing today almost the Bible being fulfilled of what went along in Rome when Jesus, John the Baptist and Jesus the Messiah came. Could it be that this would be, as Pastor Mike preached, the last Christmas that we see here on the face of the earth? We need to shake ourselves, excuse me this morning, but we need to shake ourselves and ask God, am I ready to greet the Messiah should he strip the eastern sky? Let us shake ourselves and be ready to greet him, I pray. Let us sing joyfully to him this morning.
playing with this thing? What are who he's been with? Where'd she find that guy at? Where'd he go out and her at got in trouble got out here? Who would have believed such a thing as the Holy yeah. Ghost as the father of that baby? Yeah. How'd that baby get in that womb? You think she made that mistake? I know better than that. Yeah. It was by artificial simulation. It was by the Holy Ghost power that that baby came in that womb. It was by the Holy Ghost.
Turn with me to Genesis chapter 14. And I'm going to ask you to stand if you're able again. We're going to stand as we honor God and read his word. 14th chapter of Genesis. I appreciate our sister pulling our scripture reading out of Genesis this morning. We all, we all got a beginning. That's what that book is. It, it's, a, it's a beginning. In Genesis chapter 14, we're going to read about, about a high, well, not a high priest, but a priest, king of Salem, called Melchizedek. And I'm going to attempt with the Lord's help to draw that out this morning and make that connection to our communion with Christ. So in Genesis chapter 14, starting at verse 18, I'm just going to read down through verse 20. <clears throat> then Melchizedek, king of Salem, he brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God most high, and he blessed him. Melchizedek blessed Abram, who was Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then Abraham gave Melchizedek, he gave him a tithe of all the spoils that he had brought back, as the song says, from the enemy's camp. But we're going to talk about the bread and the wine and our high priest and how that connects. Father, we thank you today that we have an opportunity to gather as your family here in your church. And we thank you already for the worship, for the songs, and for the prayer, and for the giving. And now, Lord, we worship you in this word. And Father, I just pray that as you had these words put, put into your book, that they were put down for us, that Holy Spirit, you would open them up, not just in our minds, but in our hearts today, that we might draw close to you as disciples, that we might go out of this place into the world and be better evangelists. And we'll give you all the thanks and the praise and the glory for every bit of it, because it's in your name we do and say all these things. And the saints would say, we love you, Lord. Amen, amen. Reach around and greet someone close to you, or even across the aisle if you need to. Welcome to the service today. Those who have come to, to worship with you. <coughs> Who would have believed such a thing, Charlie? I was standing there thinking the same thing. I thought, when you when you go back and you look at that, you know what? What are the? And I'll, I'll get to the sermon here in a minute. And I've got a note on here that says, "Watch the time." So you guys are going to be. I'm working on it. I have to make myself notes. But I was just thinking, who would have believed such a thing? And I thought, when, when you look at things, we we lift these people up in the Bible. And it's okay, but somehow we seem to think that they were they were different than us. We seem to think that they had some kind of a special knowledge, or they had some kind of a, a special intuition, or they were particular. Listen, these were everyday people Amen. that you would meet in the marketplace. Yes. And as Charlie said, you can imagine, yes. and you, you know, Nazareth was a small town, and when Joseph and him had to go up, when they went up with Mary. And, you know, as Charlie would say, they'd say, well, who's this baby belong to? The Holy Ghost? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, right. I know, yeah. That had never happened. It was, it was impossible. It was impossible for a virgin to be with child. But aren't you glad that's the kind of God we serve? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like a God that does impossible things. Yeah. I, I like a God that they don't just follow the, the way, you know, the human logic. And then when they said, well, then, you know, this child is, is going to be great. This child is going to be all great. He's going, to, he's going to usher the kingdom in. And then the psalm says it all. I, I've often heard it said that religion is when we try to reach out to God. But Christianity is when God reaches out to us Amen. through Christ. And, and I thought that was pretty fitting. Well, let's talk about, let's talk about the bread and the wine. We often think that, that this communion that, that we do, and, and unfortunately, this is one of those ordinances in the church that can become a ritual like anything else. 
It, it can become ritualistic if the thought is not put into it and we don't understand the true meaning behind it. It's just something that we do. The church is guilty a lot of times of just doing things because it's just something that we do. We, you know, we, we have people who, who are ill and people who face crises and, you know, just things that are out of our control. And when somebody shares that with us, we all, well, we'll, we'll just have to pray. What do you mean, just have to pray? That's right. Do you realize the power that's in prayer? Yeah. We will pray. Yeah. It's not something you just have to do. So when you think about communion, if you don't connect the dots, <laughs> as they say in the old school, then a lot of times it becomes just a ritualistic thing that we I, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to put some meaning into communion for you today that you can get that understanding so that when you take that cup and you take that wafer, that you're gonna understand what that connection is really about and what it really means. We often think that Jesus gave the disciples the bread and the wine and that that was a new development that was associated only with Christianity. If you were to ask the average Christian, and I say average, the one who, the one who doesn't study tremendously, and, and that's okay, but if you were to ask them, well, well what is communion? And, and they would say, well, it's, it's the breaking of the bread. It's the taking of the cup. It's a, you know, well, where did that start? They're going to say, well, it started at the Last Supper. It started with the Passover. You know, it started at the Last Supper before the Passover when Jesus broke that bread for his disciples. Well, no. It started way before then. Jesus was just following that, which God had already put in place in order that we might commune with him and be in covenant with this same God who was in covenant with Abraham. Abraham has pointed out to us in the book of Romans that he believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness because he believed God. It was accounted unto him as righteousness. So why would God take a man who believes in him and count him righteous and then somehow go centuries down the line and send his only begotten son to earth that he might die for sin, that he might provide a way of atonement, and then have us go through a, a holy communion, a physical type thing that would remind us of our spiritual connection with him. Why would God be any different in counting our belief different than that of Abraham's? Now, how can we look to Abraham and say, well, that was then and, and this is now? Well, listen, but God has always been God. God can say who he wants to, when he wants to. It, it doesn't have to be in a particular time. It doesn't have to be in a particular setting. As I preached at the streets, when God, when Jesus told that paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you, he hadn't went to the cross yet. That's right. He had not for any sin That's yet. Right. But yet he said your sins are forgiven. How can he do that? He's God. Yeah. Yeah. He's God. He does that. Because that's what he wants to do. So we look to the Old Testament, and we see in the Old Testament what we call Christ's veil, or Jesus being present, we just don't see it, and how in the New Testament we're able to see that. So as we see here in Genesis, it began with a priest offering this communion, offering this bread and wine to a soon-to-be patriarch of Israel. And in verse 20, Melchizedek, when he pronounced this blessing upon Abram, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your Hand. Abraham and Lot split ways. You remember that? Abram, when they had found the land. Lot went to settle in Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah was later destroyed by God. That, that's what the plan was. That's how it was going to be. Well, before that took place, Lot was captured. There was five kings that went to war 
against, against Lot's city. And five kings were going to take over the whole earth. At least so they thought. But it didn't happen. When they stole Lot and they got Lot's family, and word came to Abraham, that, or Abram at that time, that Lot had been taken, he had 318 servants that was trained in warfare. 318. You talk about a special forces outfit. Going against five kings. And he loaded them up and they went. And not only did they overcome the enemies, those kings and those armies, which the odds were innumerable, but they took back what they had taken. There's a song that says, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. Where do you think they got that from? Yep. Right here. That's where that come from. That's where that song come from. And when he came back, now let's look at this in perspective. The enemy had stolen. Abram went and rescued them and brought them back. And once they were brought back, once they got back to where they were supposed to be, then this high or this priest, I want to say high, it was a high priest, this priest, who was also a king, namely Kelzebeth, he was the king of Salem, he came out and met Abram. And, and you think that he just showed up with a piece of bread and a, <laughs> a cup of wine. No, this was what's called a covenant meal. I like the way the Old Testament patriarch did things. When, when they were going to seal the meal, they had a meal over there. You remember when Isaac got Rebecca, when they went, and they said, come on in here. They had that servant, and I'm paraphrasing, go back and read it. Come on in here and sit down, and let's eat, and let's drink, and then we'll, we'll make this covenant together. And they did that. They did that. It was a meal. So when they sat down with this meal, and this priest blessed Abel, because he knew. Now, now some theologians, I'm not one, some theologians seem to think that this was a pre-incarnate Christ. And what I mean by pre-incarnate, this was the angel of the Lord. This was Christ in the sense yeah. that he was there. And they draw that from the conclusion yeah. of what I'm going to read to you here in just a minute. Whether it was or whether it wasn't, it's still the same outcome. You're still going to get the same meaning of what happened in regards to Abram being blessed by this priest. So the enemy had stolen it. Abram had got it back. And this priest says, now that they're back, let's commune. Now that they're back, let's have this covenant, let's have this covenant meal. And that, that was how it all started. Now turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. We're going from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 1 through 11, knowing what you already know now about the Kelsey listen to what the writer in Hebrews says. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in the things pertaining to to God, that he, that the man, may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now, he, the priest, he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, those who don't know the way, since he himself is also subject to to weakness. Huh? That high priest, the one that's going to do the intercession, he, he's no better than the people he's interceding for. He's human just like they are. And because it is, because he is, he's required, as for the people, the same requirement, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sins. He, he could not intercede for the people until he was interceded for. He had to be interceded for himself before, before he could intercede for anyone. But when you seek belt Facebook, you can go into one of them little booths and shut that door and whisper in that priest's ear all you want to, that he will not be able to absolve your sins. Amen. Amen. He Amen. cannot do that. Amen. He is a man. 
Yeah. Just like any other human is. Amen. And no man, look here, no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. Dallas Jewell said one time, the problem with the ministry is we got too many volunteers. <laughs> really, you get a kick out of that, you know what he means by that. So also Christ, here we go, Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he, it was God who said to Christ, this is Psalm number 2 and verse 7, you are my son, and today I have begotten you. There you go. So where do we get that he's the only begotten son of God? We're right there in his in Psalms. That's how we know God begot him. As he it also says in another place, and this is Psalm 110, you, talking about Jesus, his begotten son, you are a priest forever. Whew, I like that word. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Amen. Amen. According to the order of Melchizedek. How's he a priest according to the order of Melchizedek? Well, let's put this thing together. The enemy stole something. He went and brought it back. And then he brought communion with God. Did you know the devil stole us in the Garden of Eden? We, we belonged to him. It, it was all his. And the devil found a way to go in and, and to steal. Jesus himself said that's the only reason he comes is to kill and to steal, steal and to destroy. But he said, I came that they, you, may have life and have it more abundantly. That don't mean you're going to have more stuff. Yeah. Having it more abundantly means more than you will ever need. You will have more life than you can ever use. That's called eternal life. And Jesus said, I will come and give them that eternal life. In the order of Michael's death. That's how it works. Who in the days, verse 7, of his flesh, when Christ was on earth, when he had offered up prayers, and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him. Yeah. Read John chapter 17. You want to see how hard Jesus prayed. Who was able to save him from death. But in that garden he said, Not my will, but yours be done. And he was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus said, I come to do your will, O Lord, and not mine. And having been perfected, that's never happened to a man. Having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to who? To all who obey him. All who obey him, called by God as high priest, according to the order of Kelsey. There you go, you got it again. Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. That's why I said it is very easy for communion to be a ritual to those who have become dull of hearing. We have heard this, we know this, we understand the process, we know what it all is. Do we really? <laughs> do we really? We, we think that we do. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to look at a couple of verses here, and I'll get back to them. Remember what we, just, what we just read in Hebrews, look here in Matthew 26, starting at verse 26. As they were eating the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it and broke it, and gave it to the disciples. The kills of that said, blessed be the God most high. And he said, take and eat, for this is my body. And then he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them. And he said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Let me throw a commercial in right here. 
I don't know what version of the Bible you have, but if it doesn't say this, it is not the right version. If your version does not say that his blood was shed for the remission of sins, if your version leaves out the blood, throw it away. Yeah. Throw it away. You got the wrong book. You got the wrong book. Well, how do I know if this Bible is a good one? Go to this verse. Go to this verse. Go, go to this, these verses here and see what it has to say about the blood and about the forgiveness of sin and the remission of sins. But I say to you, Jesus said, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That's going to happen, church. He didn't just say that. That's going to happen. The marriage supper of the Lamb. There's going to be a supper in which Christ is going to commune in person with his saints and with those who are born again just as he did with those disciples that night who were there. So the bread and the wine became the element which Jesus told, or which Jesus used, that would represent his offering up of his own body for our sins. And so to partake of the bread and the wine is to say that we are partaking the body of Christ. And that makes us a part of the body of Christ. That, and, and in this sense, it can be true, you are what you eat when it comes to spiritual things. You are what you eat. When you partake of Christ, Christ himself said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Yeah. Christ himself told his disciples, if you don't eat, you don't eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you're no part of me. And they thought, this guy is an idiot. We're not going to eat any flesh. We ain't going to drink nobody's blood. That's not going to happen. But if they would have just turn around a few more verses, a few more lines, they would have got to the part where Jesus said, the words I speak to you are spiritual. Yeah. And that's what we're going to do here today. Listen, Catholics, I need to be hard on you. But this is not going to turn into the flesh of Christ, and it's not going to turn into his blood. That is not going to happen. These are symbolic elements of what Christ did with his disciples that night at the Last Supper, which continues today, thousands of years later, so that every time we do that, we remember what Jesus said about one of these days, I will eat this and I will drink this fruit with you in my Father's kingdom. Amen. That's, Amen. What it, that's what he's getting at. Yeah. In Luke 22 and 19, he took the bread, he gave the things, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this yeah. in remembrance of me. Do this at don't do this because it's something the church does. Don't do this because you think it's just, well, it's just ritualistic type. No, no, we got to do communion. Do this in remembrance of him. Remember what he did for us. Remember what he said. One of these days I will, I will drink it you with you in the Father's kingdom. And then again in Matthew, he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which he said for the remission of sins. I'm going to ask those guys, and I can ask you to come and help us serve. I'm going to ask you if you'll come up at this time. I'm going to ask Deb to come, and she's going to play for us as, as, we, receive, as we receive this. Uh, <clears throat> I thought about just, just having the ushers hand these packets out to you as they came in, and then I and then thought, no, no, I don't think we're going to do it that way. I think we're, going to, I think we're just going to be served as we normally, as we normally have to serve. I want to read to you what the Apostle Paul has to say here out of 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul jumped on this church because they had made the Lord's Supper a party, is what they had did. They had made it a party. They had no idea that, that what they were doing had any implications upon their on their spirituality. 
or their livelihood. You know what happens to them? They become ritualistic. They, they gathered and they, and they had the supper, and Paul said that they, they were more concerned about themselves than they was for the reason of why they had to do it. So I'm going to read to you here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as we serve the communion and as we partake of this. And I want you to hear the words of the apostles so that you will know that this was just not something that happened at the Last Supper and stopped with that. But this is something that continued throughout the entirety of the church. And, and as long as I'm your pastor, it will continue throughout the Draper Valley because it is a time of remembrance of what Christ has done yeah. for us. All right. <clears throat>
It's got two layers. If you, if you feel that little top layer, go ahead and do that and you get your wafer. Like that. That'll be first. <clears throat> And if you have trouble, help one another. Sometimes they can have to. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you take and eat? And if you take that little cup and just peel the second thing off there, that'll, that'll open it up to your juice. same manner, Jesus also took the cup after supper. And he said to them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, and as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you partake of it? No. The apostle says, For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death yeah. till he comes. Can I clarify that? When you Take that bread and you drink that cup. You're saying to God, I know that you're alive. I know that when you made that promise to those disciples that night, that one day you will drink it you with them in that kingdom, you was talking to us as much as you were to them. And I know that just as you gave it that night, just as you went to that cross, just as you came out of that grave, Amen. just as you ascended back to the Father, that one day, yes. one day, you will come back mm -hmm. and receive me so that where you are, I may be also. That's what you have just signified when you ate that bread and you drank that juice. Yes. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for Jesus. Lord, as we began the service and the soul asked us who would believe such a thing, we do. We do. We have shown this morning that we believe such a thing. And Father, because of this, of this ordinance that you have given us to do in remembrance, we realize that there is, there is no power in these elements. We understand that. We understand that this is symbolic of what you did for us on that cross. That your body was broken and that your blood was spilled. That our sins might be forgiven. But you came out of that too. And you ascended to the Father. And you're there making intercession for us. But you're also here in our midst as we partake of these elements in remembering you and those things that you said to us. So we thank you, Father, that we're able to do this. And, and every time, every time that our mind goes back to this moment and to that moment, 
may we forever know that one of these days we will do this in your presence with you. And we thank you and we praise you and we glorify you in Jesus' name. And the saints would say, we love the Lord. We love the Lord. Amen. Amen. And amen. Wow. wow. Yeah, that's the only word for it is wow. Well, let's give God praise. Amen. All right, I have had the ushers. You guys would just go back. I think there's some little trash cans in the office back there. Maybe you can just hold them and people go out and you can just drop your little cup into that can if you want to as you, as you exit the church. God bless you. I pray you guys can make it to Bible study on Wednesday 